Man, wasn't that amazing? Wow. It's almost like a continuation from Friday evening. If you were here Friday evening, I'll tell you what, our worship night was incredible. It just carried right over to this morning. What an honor it is to have Garrison here, and uh, just incredible. Hey, we're wrapping up our series today, Grace Straight, No Chaser, and that song uh, just flows right into what we're going to be talking about today. Hey, do you have a uh, pair of shoes you wear when you mow grass, kind of like, you know, something like this? I don't know what you wear, but, you know, when you take the trash to the dump or when you clean out the garage and when you get dirty, you know, you just got this pair of shoes you put on. It doesn't really matter how dirty you get those shoes because that's what they're for, right? And you have a pair of shoes you wear whenever you go somewhere nice, right? Maybe you go to a wedding or a formal dinner. And some of you men are thinking, wow, two pair of shoes. I never, I never thought about that. It's, uh, isn't it true whenever you wear dirty shoes, you know, you can, you can step in mud, wet grass, whatever, and it's okay because that's what the shoes are for. And isn't it true whenever you wear nice shoes that you are cautious about every step? What's the difference? Why is that? Each pair of shoes has an identity, and the shoe's identity determines how you treat them. Listen to me very carefully. You have an identity. How do you see yourself? It's a huge question. How do you see yourself? Because how you see yourself has everything to do with how you live. For instance, when we see ourselves as dirty, we expect to be dirty. We hang around dirty things. Dirty shoes are thrown in the garage where other dirty things reside because that's what you do with dirty shoes. You throw them where other dirty things are. Clean shoes are placed in your closet so they will not get more dirty. When you see yourself as clean, you are more careful where you walk. You are more cautious about your surroundings, your associations, your conversations. Let me tell you where we're going today, okay? As I mentioned last week, some people grow nervous. And I've seen a little chatter on Facebook, a few conversations I've had with people. People grow nervous when we proclaim and when we teach radical grace. And that's what we've been doing throughout this series. When we declare boldly and with confidence because of the gospel you and I are forgiven we are righteous we are clean every sin every sin has been removed somehow when we proclaim that when we stand up and teach that when we boldly say that is what the gospel is about some people grow nervous that somehow teaching that will lead to more sinning. Man, Scott, whenever people hear that they're forgiven and that grace has covered all things, they're just going to go out and do whatever they want to do. They're just going to go out and sin more. You've got to be really careful with how you say that because that kind of teaching leads to more sinning. Listen to me very carefully. Nothing can be further from the truth. The teaching of radical grace does not lead to more sin. That is a myth. Here's the truth. When the gospel sinks in, and I mean more than just hearing it, I'm talking about it goes from the ear down into the soul of a person, and it sinks down when it clicks, when finally all things come together and you begin to see Scripture differently. You begin to see how grace is applied to your life. You begin to see that grace is not just something that gets you in, but grace is a system in which you live every day. When all of that finally comes together inside of you and you get this sense, this aha moment, this epiphany, if you will, that nothing you do causes God to love you anymore and nothing you do causes God to love you any less and you are securely in his hand, and nothing you do will change that. I'm telling you, when that finally goes off inside of you, our behavior doesn't change for the worse, but for the better. 
You stop seeing yourself as a dirty pair of shoes, and you can treat them any way you want, and you start seeing yourself as a clean pair of shoes, a whole lot more than that, a clean soul, a clean person, a person who's been bought and paid for, a person whose identity has changed. You begin to live differently, think differently, your perspectives change, your attitudes change, your behaviors change, and it is not something law and rules and policing behavior will do for you. It is something truth does for you. It sets you free. Here are two passages linking knowledge of our forgiveness and identity with our behavioral choices. This is a large part of scripture here I'm going to read to you. We're going to put it all up there for you. 2 Peter 1, 1 through 9. Let's just work our way through this briefly. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior. Let's just stop there, okay? I didn't think about this until just right now. (laughs) Lucky you. Notice how he begins. Notice the label he gives the people before he gets into anything else. Here's what I want to remind you of. I'm talking to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's setting you up for your identity. He's telling you who you are before he gets into anything else. The righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, notice the past tense he uses, have received a faith as precious. You have already received it. You have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours. Not fear and worry. Not doubt and trepidation. No, no, no. Grace and peace be yours. How much does he want you to have grace and peace? He wants you to have grace and peace be yours in abundance. And how are you going to experience grace and peace in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Notice this, he continues, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our what? Knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. You already have it, it's already yours, and when you see it, it clicks, you get the knowledge of the one who's called you, All of that stuff makes every bit of difference inside of you. Verse 4, through these, through what? These, this his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. You've already received the promises. You've already received the righteousness. You've already received everything you need to live godly. You have all of it already given to you. Next verse, so that. All of that's true so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. All these promises, all this power, all this knowledge, every single thing inside of you is put there so that you can participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption. Do you see how the knowledge and the promises and the power that is given to you gives you the ability to escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires? He goes on, for this very reason, in light of that truth, all that stuff's already done. It's all been given to you. It's all happened already. You don't have to beg for it, plead for it, work for it, strive. It's already given to you for this very reason. In light of that truth, make every effort. Now you can grow in peace. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness. You already have faith. We want you to move, mature on from faith into goodness, into goodness, knowledge, into knowledge, self-control, into self-control, perseverance, into perseverance, godliness, into godliness, brotherly kindness, into brotherly kindness, love. You're just going to keep growing and growing and growing, and you're going to grow on the foundation that you're already forgiven, you're already established, you already have the promises, you're already righteous, you're already clean, you're already forgiven. Every single thing you need has already been given to you. Now you can rest in that reality and start moving toward maturity and adding to your faith every single day, and the capstone of your faith, the crescendo of your faith, the top of your faith, the height of maturity will be what? Love. It just builds and builds and builds. Your faith, goodness, goodness, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, love. Thank you. 
That's good stuff. Let's move on. He goes, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, as you mature and mature and mature, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in what? Your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does that tell us? That tells us some people have this knowledge, some people understand these things, but they've never moved on to maturity. They just kind of stay immature. They just kind of stay a baby. They kind of stay on the milk, Paul says in another verse, the milk of spirituality rather than moving on to the meat. He says if you will continue to grow and you will continue to, to mature, you will be effective, you will be productive in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten something that's happened in the past. He has forgotten he has been cleansed from his past sins. Now here's a, something very insightful. Sometimes you meet people, hopefully you're, I know this is early service and that's not an insult, but our mind hadn't yet clicked, uh, awakened yet. But all these qualities that we use to judge whether a person is mature or not, let's assume that a person doesn't have all of those qualities in place and they're an immature person. Here's what we do. We judge them as, well that person must not be saved. That person must not be a believer. That person must not be a Christian. No, 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 no. Peter says right here that you may not grow and mature as you ought to, and the reason why is because you have forgotten you have been cleansed from your past sins. So a person can be washed and cleansed and their past is sponged and completely and totally forgiven and still not mature and go on to their crescendo of love. That means that you are a person who is saved, you are a follower of Jesus, you have been forgiven, you have been washed, you have been all these different things, but you remain an infant spiritually. That's what he's saying here. All right, another verse. We won't go through any more long verses like that, okay? Okay. And you're going to be quizzed on this at the end. I want you to know. You're going to have to repeat that before you get out of here today. Okay? James chapter 1, verse 23, 24. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So James is connecting something that you see and understand to your behavior something you understand and see to how you live your life. And if this doesn't seem to match this, it's because you have forgotten what Christ has done for you. You have forgotten that you have been cleansed. In other words, it doesn't make sense to look in the mirror and see your hair out of sorts. And I work hard on this. And you see your hair out of sorts and you see an egg, you know, a little bit of food in your, in your beard. You see some things on your face that need to be washed off and cleansed and you look at yourself in the mirror and then you walk away and do nothing about it. James says that doesn't make any sense. So when you open up scripture and you begin to read and you start seeing things about yourself that is imperfect and you see things in your life that does not reflect Christ, it only makes sense that after you've looked at yourself in scripture, after you've peered into truth and you see different things about yourself that ought to change, it only makes sense that you will walk away from that and say, God, I don't want those things in my life. Change me. I want my behavior to match what's happened on the inside. You've cleansed me, you've washed me, you've made me new, you have forgiven everything I've ever done wrong, you have cleansed my past, I am a new person, I am born again, I have been made righteous, but God, I do not act like it on Monday morning on the way to work. God, I, the way that I interacted with my spouse last night does not seem to reflect what you have done for me. And the more I peer into truth, the more I look into the mirror of Scripture, the more I look into what is true about who you say I am, I'm noticing that I'm not living Monday through Saturday the way that I'm learning things on Sunday. So would you bring my behavior up to what's real in my life? That's what James is saying. <laughs> Somebody who looks into truth and, 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 and doesn't, I mean, excuse me, anyone who listens to truth, the word, but does not do what it says is like a person who looks in the mirror, sees all the problems, and then just walks away and goes on to work. You don't comb your hair. You don't wash your face. We would say a person's crazy for doing that. The purpose of the mirror is to show you what you need to work on. The purpose of looking into Scripture is to go, wow, look Look at that attitude. It is so unlike Christ. Jesus, you have forgiven me. You have washed me. You have made me righteous in you. 
I am as loved as I'm ever going to be. There's nothing I can do that will ever make you love me more. There's nothing I can do that will ever make me love you less. So God, would you please make my behavior match what's really going on? Would you make the outside match the inside? Everybody follow me? Good. In reality, the opposite occurs. When we realize we are clean before God, and we are clean because of what Jesus Christ accomplished for us, we finally have the power and the motivation to walk away from the corruption of the world. That's what the truth of the the gospel says. Now, let's talk about a critical issue that a lot of us have and how the knowledge of truth will change this particular issue. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is huge. I would dare say that every person in this room has at least one person in your life you need to forgive. Now, maybe, that, maybe, maybe for you, that's not true. And I don't mean that in any kind of, you know, well, it, I'm sure it is, everybody does. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you've dealt with the past. Maybe you've dealt with issues that you have with people. I don't know. But I dare say most of us, if not all of us, have someone in our life we struggle with forgiving. It could be our father. It could be our mother. It could be a sister, a brother, a friend. It could be a spouse. It could be an ex-spouse. It could be our parents. I don't know. But we have someone in our life we struggle with forgiving. That is an outside thing. And because of that unforgiveness, we strain in that relationship with them. Watch how the inside should change the outside. In the letter of Ephesians, Paul addresses the attitude of forgiving. His reasoning is, since we've been forgiven we should forgive. Notice he doesn't go to fear. He doesn't go, hey, let me tell you something. If you don't forgive, God's not going to forgive you. No no kind of fear, no kind of pressure on you. You ought to forgive, you low down, dirty, rotten person. You know, you ought to do this. No, no, no. He reasons this. You have been forgiven. And because you have been forgiven, spread it around. Take the forgiveness you have received and give it to other people. Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Why? Just as in Christ God forgave you. You have received an incredible amount of forgiveness. Now take what you have been given and spread it on to other people. Here's how. Since God keeps no record of wrongs in your life, since God has released you from what you owe him, since our own forgiveness is not based on memory, what I mean by that is you got to go back and figure out every single thing you've ever done wrong. Do you realize that I spent a long time trying to track down every sin I ever committed? Because I was under the impression that if I didn't repent of a particular sin, it wasn't gone. So I had to deal with every single sin. I had to cover all my bases. Well, the gospel says you don't have to have perfect memory. When God forgives you for all sins, he forgives you for the sins you remember and the sins you don't. Because I guarantee you, we are all not smart enough to track down every single thing we've ever done wrong. There are some of you sitting in this room, you've probably sinned five times since you've been here today. And if I ask you, you could only remember a couple of them. Some of you wouldn't remember any of them. Some of us are ignorant when it even comes to the things that offend other people or offend God or opposite of the character of Christ. We don't even know what those things are. So since our forgiveness isn't based on our memory or based on our sorrow, for a long time I thought I had what repentant meant sorrow and I had to really, 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 really feel sorry for every single thing that I did wrong and if I didn't feel sorry for those sins, then they weren't expunged. Well, there were some times I didn't feel sorry at all that I told that person off. And there was no amount of convincing me you were ever going to make me feel sorry for what I said to that person. But it was still wrong. And it is not based on my apology, that I apologized the right way, that I said all the right things, some formula before God. You know, like... Believe it or not, some people think if you don't say at the end of your prayer, in Jesus' name, it doesn't count. (laughs) 
like you didn't say abracadabra so that you know it's not going to work, you know. So Paul is saying none of those things are true. You have already been forgiven. Just as Christ forgave you, go forgive other people. Since it rests solely on what was accomplished on the cross, go out and forgive other people the way you have been forgiven. Let me turn the heat up a little bit. If all of those things are true about us, it ought to also be true of other people toward us. What do you mean? If I don't have to have all the right words before God forgives me, then why do we hold out until other people say all the right words to us? If it's not based on my level of sorrow, then why will I hold out forgiveness on someone unless they really seem sorry? Well, I hear the words coming out of your mouth, but I don't think you're really sorry. Why is it that if, if it doesn't depend on me remembering every single thing that I've ever done wrong, why do we wait until somebody else can remember every single thing they did wrong to us and apologize just the right way and cover all their bases and you become convinced that they're truly sorry and once they line up all those things and cross every T and dot every I, why is it we hold out on other people if none of those things cause God to hold out on us? If God goes around and throws forgiveness our way, he doesn't sprinkle it. He throws it on us. Grace and peace in abundance. If he rains mercy down upon us, if he rains forgiveness down upon us, if he forgives us whether we remember it or not, if he forgives us and he esponges all things, what is it that we're holding out for other people? That's not just as in Christ God forgave you. You see, when you understand that, you can more freely forgive other people. What happens on the inside affects the outside. Now listen, folks, can you imagine the difference this kind of attitude would have in thousands of marriages? Can you imagine the difference that this attitude that we would forgive as we have been forgiven would have in parental child relationships, work relationships, relationships with neighbors, extended families? But, 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 absolutely critical. Only the pure, unfiltered, concentrated, 200 proof, radical grace convinces you and me that we are forgiven. Until that goes off inside of you, until that clicks inside of you, until you stand under the reign of God's mercy and grace and forgiveness and it fills you up until it overflows in your life, it's difficult for you to hand mercy to anybody else. But boy, I'm telling you, when it finally goes off and you realize that God has poured grace, he has poured mercy, he has poured compassion, he has poured kindness on you, so much so it has filled you up and it is overflowing in your life, you just kind of scoop up a whole bunch of it that's just lying around and you go, hey, you want some? You want some? Can you imagine the difference in this nation? If 50 million professing Christians really began to live forgiveness and grace as we have been forgiven, if we are not absolutely certain we are forgiven, we do not pass that forgiveness on to others. Carl Messenger, the famed psychiatrist, once said that if he could convince the patients in psychi psychiatric hospitals that their sins were forgiven, 75% of them could walk out the next day. In his research, most of the people who were dealing with emotional issues, dealing with depression, dealing with so many of the things that were their past haunting them, they carried that with them, they gnawed on that, they slept with that, they worried over that, so much so that it literally emotionally damaged them. And if they could ever get to the place where they knew that they knew that they knew that they were forgiven given their past, their present, and their future was secure within the love of God, 75 out of 100 could walk out the door the next day. 
You see how the gospel changes things? Nothing, nothing is hanging over your head. Some of us live our lives like, I sure hope nothing falls on me. I sure hope God doesn't take it out on me. I sure hope he doesn't seek vengeance on me. I've had people say, oh, Scott, I'd, I'd love to come to Forest Park, but man, if I walked in those doors, lightning would strike me. <laughs> I've had people tell me, I don't know, I was sitting there, you know, in service, and I just was thinking about all the problems in my life, and I'm just like, I'm just like, I'm lucky God just didn't strike me dead. Man, who do you serve, Thor? Lightning bolts in his hand, throwing them down at you. Do you realize there is nothing? That's the gospel. That's the good news. There's nothing hanging over your head. It was all hurled onto Christ. The anger that we have, the, the wrath that we had, the hatred that we had, he absorbed, he took, he absorbed all of it to let you know that you are loved. You are loved from the first moment you draw your first breath, the last moment you draw a breath, and all through eternity, you are infinitely loved. Does that sound like oppressive religion to you? <laughs> Say this with me, new behavior Follows new identity. Let's try that again. That was, that was, that was depressed right there. New behavior follows new. Let's try it again. New behavior follows new identity. <laughs> Let's try it all together. It's, it's not really a long line. It's only a few words. Let's say it all together. New behavior follows new identity. The behavior will follow the identity. As you begin to see yourself differently and see yourself as being washed and cleansed and loved and welcomed home, we forgive because we've been forgiven. We release others because we've been released. We see others as God sees them and as God sees us. We treat others as we've been treated. I'm absolutely convinced that some Christians are as sour as they are because their God is sour. They are as rude as they are because their God is rude. We reflect the God we worship. If we have a judgmental, hateful, mean, vicious, vindictive, punishing God, guess how we treat people who do not live or believe or behave the way we do? the same way we see God treating us. It comes out of how we see God. So let's see, let's see how treating others that we've been treated plays out in real life. If I treat my spouse the way God treats me, I will love him or her. I will show patience, kindness, understanding. If I treat my kids the way God treats me, I will teach them truth I will challenge them to be their best. I will show gentleness and kindness to them when they fail. If I treat my neighbor the way God has treated me, I will help my neighbor. I will show compassion to my neighbor. If I treat others the way God treats me, I won't steal. I won't lie. I won't cheat and hurt and retaliate toward other people because I'm loving them the way I've been loved. I will show my enemy love. I will pray for my enemy, not seek to harm or hurt my enemy, but pray for them. I will be generous, I will be merciful, I will be self-giving. Do you see how all behaviors change when we understand and live dead center of the grace of God? I begin to exhibit onto other people as I have received. It's why one of our seven, one of our seven culture statements here at Forest Park is growing people change. That's a core value we have here at Forest Park. In other words, it is impossible for you and I to learn, grow, embrace truth, understand ourselves, understand others better, grasp the power of Scripture, love God with all of our being, love our neighbors, etc., and not see a marked difference in behaviors. But the behaviors follow the gospel. 
The behaviors follow grace. The behaviors follow the fact that your identity has been changed. You are secure in him. Now you can rest and go out in love. You're not earning anything. You're not working for anything. It's already been done for you. Now go. Go splash it around. Go pour it out on other people. Go find somebody who doesn't believe they're loved and prove to them they are. Go find somebody who does not believe they're forgiven and convince them they are. Go tell them the good news of Jesus and what he has done. So, no growth in your life, no change. Little growth in your life, little change. Big growth in your life, big changes. See, preaching radical grace doesn't say, hey, now you can just go do whatever you want to do, sin all you want. No, 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 no. It's impossible. That's because if a person looks in a mirror and sees the truth about who they are and they know they're going to be loved no matter what, they don't want to live like that. They want to reflect the one who has loved them. They want to reflect the one who gave his life for them. They want to reflect the one who has forgiven and washed and cleansed. And when you begin to reflect the one who has loved you as much as he has, your behaviors automatically change. So what is the best way to get people to live right? Scare them? Oppress them? Embarrass them? No. You want behavior to change at the fundamental level if you want behavior to change at the core, if you want true transformation on the inside, the best way is to teach men and women who Christ has made them to be, what he has accomplished in them, their new identity and understanding of their identity in Christ. All of those things radically changes behaviors. Listen to me very carefully. My last shot in this series. If a person's behavior doesn't change because I know there are people sitting there going yeah but um, what if they don't change if a person's behavior doesn't change over time and with lots of patience and kindness anybody here ever received lots of patience and kindness from God if a person's behavior doesn't change over time I mean, you give them time, with lots of patience and lots of kindness, then there is a high chance the person doesn't know truth. So what do you do? You reintroduce truth. You don't introduce law. So here, here's what the church does. Here's what I've done. We tried the grace thing. It didn't work. Now it's time for the law. We've been kind, we've been patient, we've loved. Like, that's an option. We tried it, it didn't work. So now it's time to bring down the hammer. No. The truth will set you free. What is the truth? The truth is Jesus. Pilate, in front of Jesus, what is truth? He was standing in front of him. Truth is not a concept. Truth is not an idea. Truth is a person. And truth changes people's behaviors. Also, it will change emotional well-being. Can I, can I tell you a story? I'm not really asking. <laughs> I'm going I'm to tell you a story, okay? And it's, it's, it's a little embarrassing, but this is how I was when I was 18, 19 years old. And this is how the gospel changes a person's well-being. As a young Christian, one of the most difficult challenges is discovering, figuring out, understanding God's will, okay? At least that's the way it's portrayed. What is God's will? And I grew up in a culture that said, God has a will for your life and you better figure it out, okay? What does God want me to do? While growing up, I was concerned about missing God's will. I don't want to miss God's will. I don't want to miss God's will. For the most part, I was petrified to miss God's will. And the reason was very simple. I didn't want to mess up and get a long way from where God wanted me to be. Because God had this one path for me. And if I got off, 
I'm going to end up a million miles away. That fear, fear, was implanted into my mind by false teaching, which produced an incorrect and unhealthy perspective of God. And false teaching, if left in your head long enough, can lead to mental illness. That's why I believe one of the greatest incubators of mental illness in this nation is bad, unhealthy churches. Poor religion has caused more people to get on anxiety medication than almost anybody, anything else I know. Well, that, that's another sermon. We'll, we'll take that out just in case people get offended. No, we won't. We'll leave it in. We'll let people get offended, right? I don't say that in any arrogance. It sounds arrogant, but I don't. I say that with humility because I've been there. I've done that. And I'm embarrassed of it. But that fear was implanted in my mind through false teaching. Good people, I don't think that they had any intention to do that. It was ignorance. Here's how that worked out in my life. When I was 19 years old, I fell deeply in love with my, my wife today, Lana. And she was 20. I liked older women. <laughs> and I was 19. But because of my unhealthy perspective of God... I came to believe through my own wacky way of thinking that Lana was a hindrance to God's purposes in my life because I believed I was called into ministry and I was going to do this and I was going to do that. And I began to see her as a hindrance to my ministry propositions in life. I reasoned that I could soar higher spiritually if I simplified all my relationships, including my relationship with Lana. So I called off the relationship. I still remember the conversation. I still remember where I was sitting. I still remember the tears. I still remember the confusion. Knowing the entire time I was breaking her heart, yet trying to reassure myself in some way I was pleasing God. Because how did I see God? I saw him as a, a tyrant. I saw him as a difficult master. I saw him as a hard to please boss of the universe. After a roller coaster ride with my emotions, a lot of prayer, counsel, I became convinced that I was now ready for commitment. So I persuaded Lana we were to be together. Reluctantly, she came back, only for me to break up again. Somehow I thought God was testing my faith. Let me try to explain why I was so whacked out, okay? I had grown up in an environment with a heavy emphasis on finding God's will, which required diligent searching and a high possibility of missing his will. I was taught God had one will for my life, and if I missed it, I would end up with less than God's best, possibly ruining my entire life. See how dangerous that is? So much pressure that is on a 19-year-old. Needless to say, it became extremely difficult to find God's perfect will. I mean, come on, there were 26,419 choices out there. And all of them were wrong. Only one was right. I was paralyzed, terrified. My religion taught me God wanted to control every single move. And he would refuse to bless anything that wasn't perfectly within his will. So if I married Lana and it wasn't what God wanted, that I would be outside his will. And he would love me. He had to. Some law told him he had to. That's how, that's how I kind of believed it. He was forced to. He wanted to kill me, but, you know, Jesus stepped in the middle. <laughs> you know, he was going to punch me, but instead he punched him. So I'm good, I guess. <laughs> but he would be displeased with me my whole life. As a result, I battled episodes of anxiety, panic attacks, sleepless nights, loss of appetite, mood swings. I dreaded waking up in the morning. I longed for the sweet release of sleep and did not want to wake up. And I'm going into the ministry. And you think I'm by myself in that? Oh, no. So what happened? 
It would take me a long time to explain 20 years. It took an understanding of the gospel to set me free from God. Let that sink in. It took an understanding of the gospel to set me free from God, little g, God, the God I had in my mind. I had to literally bring the concept of God to the altar and lay him down because God was hindering my relationship with God. Sometimes we need to be delivered, not sometimes, most of the time, if not every time, we need to be delivered from the gods we have worshipped. And many of those gods we've worshipped, the little g, has Christian written in front of them. It took an understanding of the gospel to set me free. Today, I understand God is not interested in controlling my every move. Now, I'm, I made a huge jump, and that's a whole series in and of itself. Nor does God speak in code. And I got to, you know, listen extra carefully or I'm going to miss his perfect will for my life. Man, when the gospel went off inside of me, do you, you want to talk about weight being lifted from me? You want to talk about 500 pounds coming off my shoulders when I began to realize that all those things that I had, not all, but many of the things I had believed about God were not true and they came out of paganism more than they came out of Christianity? Would you, just, you know, check scripture. Let me just give this to you quickly. It's a little side note. I, just, I almost didn't put this in the message, but I want to give it to you quickly because it might help somebody here struggling with the will of God. When you, when you, when you check scripture, you'll discover there are five the will of God basically comes down to five things. I'm going to give it to you. I'm not going to teach through this. I'm just going to give it to you quickly. In other words, here's the bullseye. You want to know what God's will? Here's the bullseye. No one perishes, but all believe. That is the bullseye of God's will. Number two, salvation taken to the Jews and Gentiles. Scripture is very clear. That's God's will. Take the message of Christ to Jews and Gentiles alike, all people. Three, we present our bodies to him daily. Four, we bear much fruit. And five, we pray throughout our lives. Take the message of Christ to the ends of the earth. I don't want anybody to perish, but all believe. I want you to present your bodies to me, your hands, your feet, your tongues, your minds to me every single day. I want you to bear much fruit in your life. And I want you to pray throughout your lives. Other than that, go do whatever the heck you want to do. What? Fall in love with God and go do whatever you want to do. Because when you fall in love with God, there'll be a lot of things you won't ever do again. Amen. That's his will. Christ would live in us and express himself through us. We make it difficult. Here's the freedom in this, okay? Instead of wondering, and this is how I lived, folks. I know some of you are like, man, that, that, you, you were whacked out, man. I know. Some of you don't even struggle with some of the things that I struggle with, and I'm so glad you don't, okay? But instead of wondering, is God behind door number one? Is God behind door number two? Or is God behind door number three? You've got 10 seconds. Ding, ding, ding. And you're just like going, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Okay, I think it's two. No, 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 no. It's, it. Okay, I'm going to go with one. I'm going to go with one. I'm going to go with one. Please, 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 please. God, be there. No, 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 no. The gospel has shown me Oh, I hope this goes off. I hope this, I hope this ricochets on your soul. God is behind every single door. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will be with you to the ends of the earth. And even when you pick the most stupid door, it's the most ridiculous thing. God doesn't leave you.
God goes with me wherever I go. And even when I get into mess and dirt, he is there. And he will remind me of my identity when I am ugly and he will walk me back to health. So now, I pray, I study, I read, I seek counsel, I seek wisdom. I want my heart to be in tune with God, and I go for it. And I say, God, I'm walking this way. And I know you're with me. And I know you won't leave me and you won't forsake me. And if I get myself in a mess, and I know, I just want you to know, God, I will get myself in a mess. I'm going to trust you'll lead me out. I'm going to step out of this boat, just like Peter, and I'm going to put my feet on the water, and I believe you're going to hold me up. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm probably going to sink. And when I do, I'm going to call on your name. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to pull me back up again. And together, we're going to walk back to the boat. And then I'm going to be holy the rest of my life. No. Because the same guy who walked on the water denied Christ three times. And then when you deny Christ three times, you're out. There's no hope for you. No. Because the same guy who denied Christ three times preached the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people were saved. And then when you stand up and preach and 3,000 people were saved, you're never going to mess up again. No, that's not true. Because Paul had to withstand Peter face to face because Peter confused the gospel and compromised the truth of God's word. (laughs) you you see whichever door you choose there's God that's the gospel my friend you are secure in him live breathe rest sing rejoice go for it go for it all right I got more slides help me let me summarize and close Grace straight proclaims your bondage to the law is gone. Your bondage to your old self, gone. Your bondage to sins, gone. All obstacles preventing closeness, gone. It's amazing how simple and straightforward is grace. If it's the real thing, it will change lives radically. But it will also bring controversy. Wherever the real gospel is taught, It's resulting in false accusations every single time. Let me give this to you quickly, last verse. Listen to John, 1 John 2, 1. My dear children, I write this to you. Why does John write it? Read it to me out loud. So that you will not sin. Nobody is saying absorb grace so you can go sin. No, no, he's writing all of this so you won't sin. But... If anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Anytime you present the gospel, live the gospel, build a church centered on the gospel, you will get controversy. Dr. Andrew Farley, who has taught me a lot about grace, I presented some of the material to you in this series. He writes, grace in your face brings accusation. That's all there is to it. I want to close this series out with a quote, and then we're going to pray, and we're going to, we're going to go. And those of you who are new to Forest Park, and you're thinking, does he preach this long every week? No. <laughs> Typically longer, but anyway, I'm, I'm sorry. I just get excited. One of the most famous pastors uh, who, who lived in the history of preaching is Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was pastor of Westminster Chapel in London for 30 years. This guy was a master uh, expositor of scripture. In fact, he spent eight years, eight years just in the book of Romans. That's how slowly and methodically he went through verse by verse by verse, eight years. There's a, a quote by him that's so beautiful, and it's a litmus test that we can use to tell whether or not we're preaching the true gospel, okay? Uh, Lloyd-Jones passed away, I think it was 1981, so he was 
quite a while back. He would preach for an hour and a half, two hours sometimes, prior to TV, prior to radio. So that's all messed us up. But listen to what he said. Here's a long quote, but I want to read it and then we're going to pray. He said, there is no better test as to whether a man is really preaching the New Testament gospel of salvation than this, that some people might misunderstand it and misinterpret it to mean that it really amounts to this, that because you are saved by grace alone, it does not matter at all what you do. You can go on sinning as much as you like because it will redound all the more to the glory of grace. That's the misunderstanding that people will say you're saying. He goes on. If my preaching and presentation of the gospel of salvation does not expose it to that misunderstanding, then it is not the gospel. There is this kind of dangerous element about the true presentation of the doctor of salvation. In other words, if you don't preach it strong enough that some people walk out and say, he says you can do anything you want. If nobody says that about your presentation of the gospel, then it isn't pure enough. Preach it so pure, some people will walk out and say, he thinks you can do anything you want to if you just have grace. Is that what you misunderstood? Yes. Then finally, I'm preaching it straight enough. The gospel at first appears dangerous, but upon closer examination, we realize it is the only message that sets anybody free. So there is only one response to straight grace. Thank God. Let's pray. Father, how amazing you are. How incredible you are. You have washed us. You have cleansed us. You have changed us. You have saved us. You have redeemed us. You have made us new. May that truth explode inside of us. Our hands will get lighter. Our feet will be quicker to tell other people the good news. Our mouths will open to your praise and to your honor. We will sing it. We will give to it. We will want to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Why? So watch people, the light come on in people. Watch the truth set them free. Watch them walk and sing and love and expose other people to the light of truth. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for washing and cleansing us. Thank you for setting us free. In Jesus' name.